This is the FCI Podcast. I'm Attila Martum, and in this episode, we cover one of the most significant dog welfare issues, stray dogs. This is a matter which has been a serious topic in many countries worldwide for a very long time, and the solution is not an easy issue at all. I have two guests today from Four Paws, Dr. Catherine Pollack and Manuela Rawlings. Catherine currently serves as the head of Stray Animal Care Southeast Asia for Four Paws International, and she's operating in Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And Manuela is the head of Stray Animal Care Europe for Four Paws International, targeting stray dogs and cats in Bulgaria, Romania, and Ukraine. I'm really happy that both of you accepted my invitation. Both of you have extensive experience. I don't think we should discuss why it is crucial to reduce and manage the population of stray dogs. It is really a problem in many countries, I would like to focus on effective strategies and solutions. What do you think, based on your personal experience, what the key points are in reducing number of stray dogs? Sure, would you like me to go first, Manuel? I'm happy to jump in. I mean, you know, it, it goes without saying that every situation is different. Every country is different. Even provinces and cities within countries are very different in terms of you know, the, the problem, um, but also the underlying causes of that problem, right? And so we have to always take a, a high altitude view and a comprehensive approach in terms of how do we create uh, a management strategy that effectively not only addresses, okay, we probably everyone on this, on this uh, who's listening in, you know, are hopefully dog lovers, right? We have animal welfare you know, in our hearts and, and is the foremost of our attention. Um, and so, of course, we always strive to address that immediate, you know, animal welfare issue. But we also have to take a step back and say, well, why is the issue why it is, right? Like, why are there so many dogs? Why are they reproducing? Why are these animal welfare concerns? And when we start to, you know, look at addressing those questions or answering those questions, then it becomes apparent where we have to best direct our attention, our efforts, and our always limited financial resources. And in some cases that might be spay neuter, that might be sterilization, Um, but in other cases it might be more education. It might be community engagement. It might be looking at waste disposal in some places. Um, And so certainly the the strategies that we take at Four Paws vary dramatically. You know, the strategy that we might take in Thailand or in Vietnam differs pretty dramatically from that in, in Eastern Europe. So we have, you know, a variety of activities in our toolkit and it's up to us to say, okay, well, how do we best prioritize limited resources and pick the tools in our toolkit that are best applicable or most effective in the various situations? I think what I can add on to this is the solution for any um, stray animal welfare problems are always humans. So while as the animal welfare organization, we want to help the dogs, um, we very um, often end up um, working with communities, working with people, working with um, pet owners, working with children in communities. Um, We firmly believe that um, while every individual matters and we want to save every single dog's life, um, we also um, have to prevent future suffering. And that really means creating an environment where there won't be further animals abandoned, further animals born on the streets. Um, And we can only do this if we can engage communities. The change needs to come within. Um, We are just very few. We cannot, uh, we we really want to make a big difference. We want to have a big impact, not just save individual animals. And thus we need to change the humans in communities. It sounds to be a massive and very complex uh, issue and and, and a solution plan. And I I think, uh, let's talk about a bit about about why there are so many stray dogs. Because because as you mentioned, uh, it is is the starting point to find the reason why there are so many stray dogs. So what is the reason behind that? Because it's, I think it is very important to understand this part, to, to understand the root cause of, of this whole, whole animal welfare matter. 
Yeah, I, I think Manuela hit the nail on the head in her last response is that generally it's human behavior driven. Um, generally speaking, and again, this varies dramatically depending on the location, but it very often is driven by human behavior. It can be driven by pet abandonment. It could be driven by a lack of sterilization of owned animals that are then allowed to go outside, reproduce. Um, certainly we do see populations of dogs that are born onto the street. So that does happen as well, um, particularly in more rural or difficult to, to access areas. However, in my experience, it's generally the minority of animals. Um, the animals that we see, particularly in Southeast Asia, on the streets are often abandoned pets um, or they're more what we would call community owned. So many people feed the dogs, but potentially, you know, perhaps not one person says, oh, yeah, that's that's my dog. Um, but yet it does have many owners in a sense. Um, and then those dogs often go on to reproduce as well. Um, and so it creates this unfortunate cycle um, of more and more dogs that, you know, it doesn't take a mathematician or a statistician to do some simple math to understand that the populations can grow, you know, quite exponentially in a short amount of time. Yeah, and same for um, Eastern Europe. What we do see is um, a lot of abandoned pets, a lot of um, abandoned puppies. Um, you know, the dogs on the streets have very few resources available to them. So generally, while they breed, and um, this is a huge welfare um, issue, we know that most of these puppies don't survive and don't add to the population. Um, the dogs that do survive are usually the juveniles, the six to eight months old that are no longer cute puppies and then are dumped somewhere in the middle of nowhere and have to fend for themselves. So if you, if you, if you uh, separate uh, the different types of, types of, of, of stray dogs, those ones who are, are uh, born and raised on the streets or, or out in the woods or, or wherever, and those are those ones who 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 were born and into human human environment, and after some point they got abandoned. I, from my perspective, these are two absolutely different different uh, situations, and and you cannot really mix mix the two things because because for example, from from the aspect of of behavior and ecology. Uh, the, these dogs are, are different, and I'm sure the rehabilitation uh, process is, is different. But how, what can you do? Uh, how, how you set up a strategy? If, you, if we focus on, on those dogs which are, are born and, and raised by the street, let's say so, uh, what can you, you do with this population? Yeah, well, I mean, I, as you mentioned, these are different populations of dogs. However, it can be difficult to know. And, you know, if you're just standing back and you're looking at these dogs, is it an abandoned pet? Was it born? I mean, we can certainly assess based on behavior, um, but the reality is oftentimes these dogs act similar. If they're scared or, you know, they don't know life on the street, they might actually act quite similar to that of a dog that, you know, was, a, was born onto the street. So while we can say that they're distinct populations, oftentimes actually they, they become quite blended and, and the approach often is the same to address these dogs. Um, for dogs that, you know, are truly feral, which, which again is the minority, like it, it is certainly the minority that were born on the street that have had no human contact. Um, that, that requires an approach that's more based, at least for us here in Asia on, you know, mass kind of sterilization, spay, neuter work that these dogs, particularly if they are doing okay in the environment, we, of course, we want every animal to have a home like that. That's the goal. But we do recognize that there are these subsets of the population where they're not going to be rehomable into people's homes. And so if they're doing okay, um, there is available resources to them, you know, then we will direct our focus on, you know, more mass type sterilization work where we capture the dogs, sterilize them, vaccinate them, deworm them, uh, and then we will put them back into their community with the intent of humanely decreasing that population over time. Of course, you know, I'm simplifying it because it requires maintenance, sterilization, and, and all these other components. Um, but that's strictly the, the sterilization work for, for that type of population. Whereas dogs that maybe are rehomable, um, you know, they might have a different pathway that we would look at. I would like to lean myself out here and say that in, in 
Europe, I think we have hardly any truly feral um, dog populations. The dogs that are born on the street, um, dogs are um, domesticated. They seek out human um, settlements and dogs that are born on the streets are still born uh, very close to human proximity. So they are maybe born in an apartment building block um, in the basement or they are born, um, you know, in a park uh, where there's still um, people around. So they do have interactions with humans, maybe not, not always in the most positive um, way. Um, so just like Catherine said, um, it's sometimes very difficult to um, say, is this just a very scared pet that has already lived in a home or is it truly a feral dog that um, is maybe uh, still very young and um, behaviorally flexible and can adapt quickly to a home situation? What I would look, like to point out is um, obviously what we also see in Eastern Europe and from an animal welfare um, point is very concerning is um, dogs that have to spend long, long, long times and sometimes we are talking years in shelters that are not adequate and that are not meeting the animal's needs. And so um, these might also be uh, dogs that are more challenging to place in a home environment. I do think that from um, we can learn a lot from what cat rescue groups have done recently. Um, they have placed um, cats into working homes. And um, we don't see this yet happening a lot in Europe, but I think with a little bit more resources in um, and especially knowledge in shelter environments, um, this could be also something um, that we could look at for um, dogs that might not do really uh, well as pets in your average uh, family with kids and uh, going on walks and, um, you know, interacting in a friendly and appropriate way with people and other animals. Yeah, it's such a good point that you brought up about the sheltering, and I was hoping that would come up. Uh, later on, but it's good to address it up front, is that we often see this knee-jerk response of, oh, well, there's too many dogs, let's build a big shelter. Like, see it we're over and over. Like, if I had a dime for every time I had this conversation. And it seems like, yeah, that makes sense, particularly if you're a municipal leader and, you know, these dogs are causing an issue and your constituents are saying they want a solution, well, let's just put them all in a shelter. Seems easy enough. And we just see this play out time and time again in almost the exact same fashion where you know shelters take an incredible amount of resources to run um, and there's never sufficient resources to provide the care that these animals would need not only to provide their basic needs but to actually rehabilitate them and, and run a successful rehoming program this just never happens um, the way that you know it's the intention is and so um, we always uh, yeah try to dissuade uh, the sheltering approach just because we know what the, the end outcome is and it's, it's not good for the animals. And generally it fails to address the solution uh, or the actual issue of dog overpopulation. So. And this is where we are back at why it is so important to reduce the dogs on the streets. Because if we have a much smaller number of dogs on the streets, um, they can successfully enter a um, sheltering scheme um, be rehabilitated in a short period of time and then um, go into homes. Dogs that have to spend um, years in shelters are very, very difficult to place. I think sheltering, uh, I mean the procedure and what to be, be careful and how to do it uh, professionally is another huge topic we could talk about. And, and I, it is, it, from my perspective, sometimes it's sad to see that that the people are really enthusiastic about about helping animals. Uh, they start to to run a shelter without the proper knowledge of how to how to uh, run the shelter, how to manage the animals, how to re rehabil rehabil uh, how to rehab rehabilitate uh, the, the the behavioral issues, for example. And, and this is a very, very important thing to, to, to have the kind of knowledge because, because after a while, as you said, it will be, I wouldn't say impossible, but in many cases, it will be impossible to, to, to rehome an animal. And even if the, the rescu rescued animal uh, is, is, is having really serious issues, uh, then, then it, it, will be, it will be impossible in the, in the long run. So it is a very important aspect as well, I think. And yeah, 
I think in many countries in Eastern Europe um, and beyond um, around the world, um, rescuers have a very difficult um, choice to make. Um, it's often, am I putting the animal back on the street um, with the risk that um, it leads a very short life and gets killed in um, a car accident or worse? Um, or am I trying to shelter this, this animal? And like you said, um, in many countries around the world, animal behavior is a relatively new um, uh, domain. It's something that um, universities don't necessarily teach. It's not widely available. Um, and thus we are running into these um, issues where um, the necessary knowledge is not available. I, I fully agree. I, I know some Eastern European countries well, and and this is this is a problem. And and enthusiasm is is not enough. You need to have the, the professional knowledge how to do something uh, uh, properly. So can I say that that. In, in, in those countries where the feral population or, 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 or those dogs which are connected, partly connected to, to the human environment, they, they get on well, really well. Uh, but the population is that huge. Uh, can I say that you cannot rehome all dogs, but you have to make sure that, that uh, these uh, dogs get vaccinated, that get uh, neutered, uh, they get fat, for example, but you cannot uh, rehome all dogs because the population is so huge. If I'm right, there are such countries like, like uh, I think, Turkey and, and probably Greece, but I'm sure there are many other countries where the population management focuses on this kind of approach because there are, the, the population is, is too big at the moment. I would say, and it, certainly I can speak to the, the countries that I work where we do have significant stray animal populations. We're talking about millions upon millions, yes. We cannot shelter and adopt out of this situation. That's correct. You know, shelters really should be for, you know, a select number of animals that are, you know, potentially rehomable, that there is capacity to provide appropriate care. There's capacity to actually adopt these animals out. There's capacity for providing appropriate medical care, you know, for at-risk animals in situations where, again, resources allow groups to do that. And um, again, it, it has to be for a select number of the population. We can't use it as a blanket approach to dog population management. And what, uh, what is the situation in, in Eastern Europe? Because I know that in, in, uh, in, in, in many, many countries, uh, the, the main ob objective, the main goal of, of animal welfare organizations uh, is sometimes that we have to, to, to pick up all dogs, we have to rehome all dogs, and it is impossible because they don't have the capacity, they don't have the assets, they don't have the money, they don't have the stuff, and it is... It is some something. Uh, it is a never-ending, never-ending uh, a fight and struggle for the animal welfare organizations. It's actually very interesting um, because the countries are very different, um, and what we come across is that the countries that do the best with regards to stray animal, stray dogs on the streets, um, and uh, also rehoming and quick turnover in shelters are the ones that in the last couple of years, and this is re really the last decade, have managed to build a strong local adoption culture. So in countries where, um, you know, in Germany, Austria, it is, is, is very popular to adopt a dog by now. It's um, considered um, a positive thing to do. Um, and we see this happening also in other Eastern European countries. I think a very positive example is Poland, where we see um, really um, a huge progress in reducing the um, number of dogs on the streets. Um, and um, nice shelter facilities with um, a very quick turnover of dogs. Um, maybe a negative example uh, would be Romania, because their adoption, local adoption, is hardly existent. We, um, the communities that we work in, they um, will send animals way more, I think 10 times more animals um, to Western European countries. So Germany, Austria, Switzerland, the UK, um, than what they have um, 
local adoptions. However, on the other side, um, Romanians are very dog loving. They all own dogs. Um, it's one of the countries where almost every second household um, owns a dog. So if we could change this and build a stronger local adoption culture, um, that would very, very positively influence um, the number of dogs that we see in the streets. Do you think, is it just the adoption culture or, or uh, a change in, in the way how the society thinks about keeping animals and abounding or not abounding animals. Because, because uh, I, I, I see countries where in, in, in Western Europe where, where these, these kind of animal welfare issues are, are not that significant problems, but the society has an absolutely different idea about how to keep animals, how to, how to home breed animals, because I, in Eastern Europe, it is still a problem that, that, that people, people uh, reproduce the number of dogs at home. And in, in Western countries, I doubt that, that this kind of mentality uh, exists. I think there, there, there is a huge difference Between, between how, how these, these different societies see uh, the way how to keep a dog responsible. I fully agree with you. Um, and this is what we um, put under the umbrella of responsible pet ownership. So you mentioned already the big pillars. I think it's um, abandonment prevention, um, then um, adoption culture, and obviously uh, preventing of um, unwanted litters of um, pets. Um, and then there's additional um, topics uh, with regards to animal welfare. For example, dogs on chains is something that is still very, very common in Eastern Europe and you don't, um, and also actually in, in, in the SARS a lot. Um, it's not something that uh, we see in Western Europe anymore. Um, I do think that um, there is a little bit of positive in this, in the sense that um, we see that culture can actually change very quickly. Um, we sometimes, I think, um, animal welfare, welfare organizations get discouraged about the fact that um, human behavior change, it takes a long time. Um, it's really a challenging project to implement, but we do see countries making big strides in maybe a decade. Um, so this is not a very long time and there can be huge change achieved in um, culture and behavior of, of people as well in a shorter period of time with the right um, communication resources. Yeah, this is the key word, right. You, you, you need to know how to do that. And that's why, for example, and that's why I started with the, the root causes. Because if you don't understand the the whole 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 problem, whole problem, and you cannot see uh, the reason why there are so many dogs on the street, you may pick up a, a wrong kind of strategy, and it will not work. That's that's why I think, from my perspective, it is so. That's why it's so important to understand the real causes behind behind why there are so many dogs on the street. And we uh, and we talked about the 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 freely roaming population. And I think uh, in, in many countries, especially in Europe, the biggest problem is dog abandonment. And uh, I think there are more, more uh, different reasons behind why people abandon their dogs. What is the reason behind why people abandon their dogs? Because we love dogs, everyone loves dogs. And, and we start to have dogs because we want to have a puppy because it's cute and, and to live together with a dog is a fantastic thing, but something goes wrong at some point. But we also live in a society where we um, constantly want instant gratification and where um, putting in a little bit of money or effort is often already too much. So a dog is a lifelong commitment. Um, a dog um, needs daily exercise, um, daily attention. Um, and I think um, it, it needs uh, money, uh, investment. Um, so I think people sometimes underestimate this. And this obviously falls under responsible pet ownership um, in the sense that one um, 
informs, um, you know, you inform yourself up front what your new car is going to be able to do and what you need to do in order to um, keep it for the next 15 years in a good condition. And people don't do this about dogs. Um, you know, it's also a very emotional connection. You see these cute puppies in the pet shop and you go in and you buy one. And only later, even, maybe you do yeah, the research. I, I think you might be overestimating that most people do that about their car. I think, you know, people don't, people don't know what they don't know, right? And it's unfortunate that, you know, there isn't potentially enough resources out there. Um, and this involves the veterinary community as well to make sure that, yeah, veterinarians are trained in, you know, treating ear infections, giving vaccines, but also educating clients and educating the public on uh, responsible pet ownership, what that means, what to expect, um, how to deal with behavior issues. Um, and in some places, you know, this is non-existent. I mean, literally non-existent for, for pet owners. And so people are, I, I like to think, well-intentioned and want to do the right thing. Um, but there's also a, an access to care issue. I think that also needs to be discussed that in so many communities, there are no trained veterinarians to provide humane, let's say spay neuter procedures. Um, and so, you know, this also compromises the care of animals, um, you know, when, when people have pets, but then, you know, they have accidental litters and, you know, they can barely afford to feed this animal. Now they have, you know, six more animal, you know, mouths to feed. So uh, it's, again, it's a complex issue, but we have to always look at, you know, uh, how are we providing resources to people and really changing the stray dog situation through people, um, which is often, you know, again, we focus in on the individual animal, you know, we're animal welfare charity. This is what we're going to do. We're going to go and help all the animals, but we just can't, you know, address the landscape of stray animal overpopulation without ignoring, um, you know, access to care, veterinary training and human behavior change. It's so interesting that you you mentioned this because because uh, yeah from from my my from my side I, I think that that okay here in Europe we have uh, internet in our pocket I, if I if I want to get knowledge I I, I can look up anything uh, I'm on Facebook I can join Facebook groups to 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 gain knowledge and it is not true everywhere information and knowledge is not, not available everywhere. And, and meanwhile, it, it, is, it is an absolutely different topic. About, it is about online communication and, and such stuff that in those countries where these information are available, uh, it, it is still not enough. I agree with that. And I, I often say that, that first, you have, to, you have to think that, that people are not bad. They just don't know what they don't know, and you have to give the chance to you have to give them the chance to to educate themselves. But in many 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 cases, and I think this is a huge challenge in the modern era. You cannot convince people that come on, you are wrong. And and I have I have a lot of friends who are vets, and they are complaining that 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 people are graduated from Facebook. They read all kind of all kind of things there, and and uh, and and that who has been practicing for for decades can't convince the person that okay, I don't care what you read in the Facebook group, but you yeah. are wrong. <laughs> so, yeah, they talk to Doctor Google. Yeah, <laughs> free yeah. consult. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it is it is uh, so we it it is important to no. Again, it, it, it perfectly shows that if you want to, not just to, to, to handle the, the dog population management issues, but when you want to educate uh, the general society keeping dogs, you have to uh, really uh, make uh, an evaluation about the country, about the, the for example, the religion, uh, the habits of the society, because it is different. We are talking about now about continents, but if, if we just just uh, take a look at uh, Hungary and Austria, which are neighbor countries, you can see significant differences in, in many, many things. Yeah. And in our project in Eastern Europe, uh, we even break it down into municipalities. Um, so if we look at um, a large city in Eastern Europe, it might be very, very different 
to a small, uh, very rural area somewhere um, very far away from, from any resources. So it's really, um, like you already mentioned, it's important to get a good understanding of what is actually happening in a smaller uh, location so that we can target the many different um, tools in our toolbox to reach maximum impact. And uh, because we spoke about communication, I think, um, you know, there's tons of information out there. Um, there's way too much. Um, and um, you, most people then don't know how to pick um, the, the, let's say, right one anymore, the responsible one anymore, and tend to go with the one that is convenient, isn't it? And so what we're trying to do with our project is to not just reach people online, but to really be on the ground and work with communities face to face. And that has been a very big challenge in the last uh, two years with COVID, as you can imagine, because um, meetings face to face um, was almost um, an impossibility. But we see that online communication is not the only thing um, that uh, we can put out there and expect people to, to change their behaviors. Um, it needs to go a lot deeper. Um, we also, for example, work with, uh, um, in Eastern Europe, we work with um, stray dogs that we rescued and trained as um, therapy dogs. So these dogs become ambassadors of our um, projects and of our ideas. They go and they visit children and they visit all their homes and they visit, um, you know, stakeholders. They go and visit the mayor in a municipality. Um, and so they stand for um, all the other dogs in the streets and they can show that um, dogs can be rehabilitated. Um, they um, can, former strays can become valuable members of, of society. And so we need these personal contacts. We need the personal connection as well, well as wonderful material being made available online. And, and I just would like to go back to to dog abandonment, the reasons, the different reasons behind that, because it, I know it's, it's a very huge topic, why people people decided, okay, I would love to have a, a puppy, I, I take some pictures to Instagram, I will get my my, my gratification and, and all the feedbacks, but, but after a while, I probably realized that, that uh, for example, I, I have to 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 cost money on, on my on my dog, and and what what type of reasons behind behind abandoning dog? I think probably I, I speak for for both regions that we work in. It's often due to you know behavioral issues uh, with the dogs, and they might not necessarily be inappropriate issues. They might be normal dog behavior issues that pet owners just aren't aware of, educated, uh, competent at responding to. Um, and so we certainly see that as a commonly cited reason why, you know, dogs are abandoned. And, and these reasons are also similar, right? When we look at, you know, shelter metrics as well, why are animals being, you know, abandoned at, at shelters as well? Um, we often see housing issues, issues with landlords, um, certainly during times of COVID as well, we've seen increase, you know, certainly shelter abandonment of animals, people that you know, need to return to their own countries or need to move um, suddenly aren't able to find accommodations with pet friendly you know landlords or policies um, we also see you know medical conditions people that aren't equipped again to to handle dog medical conditions or maybe they can't afford you know veterinary care depending on where they are or maybe veterinary care isn't available you know conveniently in the areas that they live um, and certainly costs i think is becoming increasingly an issue as well in terms of you know, many people are under, you know, financial duress during COVID and, you know, this is certainly an additional expense. I'm not sure if Manuela, you had any additional, you know, thoughts on that. I think it's a global um, issue that we, that we perceive in all our countries, unfortunately, yes. Uh, and maybe what you haven't mentioned yet, it is again, sterilization. So um, pets that are not sterilized, um, but are free roaming will fall pregnant um, if it's a female, no matter, <laughs> you know, this, this is not magic. Um, 
we know um, how the bees and the flower works. Um, and so, um, and this is sometimes really surprising for people. Um, and then they stand there with a litter of, you know, a dog can have 12 puppies in the worst yeah. of cases. Um, and then what to do? Then they find uh, for two or three a friend um, that takes that and then the other ones um, get bigger and they start chewing and uh, destroying things and then they end up um, abandoned. So um, to increase the sterilization rate of owned pets in Eastern Europe is a huge topic. And like Catherine mentioned, um, veterinarians are also um, a big uh, stakeholder in this. Um, they see animals for vaccinations. Um, so we do hope that they will also, um, you know, advise on sterilization if this is not a poor bred dog with a um, registered breeder. Uh it, it is it is it is a huge huge issue and and uh, it it is so so strange to to talk to people living in Western Europe and they don't really get the picture why it is such a huge campaign in many Eastern European countries to to nurture the dogs because because it's it's a huge issue and I'm Hungarian I I spend a lot of time in Hungary and I see this as one of the biggest problem because because. Okay, we love dogs and, and we want to have puppies because puppies are cute. I can get some pocket money for, for the puppies. And, and I, but after a while, I don't care what happens to the, to the puppies. And in many cases, it, it triggers much more issues because these people have no experience about how to raise a litter, uh, how to take care about, about a mother dog. And, and in many, many cases, they separate the puppies from the mother, from the litter, at, at a very early stage, around four weeks. And I'm not talking about the, 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 the illegal puppy trade, because that is an absolutely different topic again. But, but I'm talking about this home breeding, backyard breeding. And, and people have no, no idea about this. And there will be dogs which will develop uh, health problems because the lack of, of uh, proper nutrition, Dogs missing a proper socialization, and they get to a family at a very early stage. They will develop uh, really serious uh, behavioral problems, and 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 in many cases, uh, I don't want to to go to the direction of of, of breeding and breeds and pure dogs, but it, but there are those kind of dog uh, characteristics. And one of you mentioned before that, that sometimes the dog has no, no behavioral issues, but it is not suitable for the owner. So there are those kind of, 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 of dogs which are not really suitable for a certain family. And, and people just, just pick up a dog that, oh, this is so cute. I will look really good uh, with this dog on, on Instagram and they pick up that kind of puppy and they shouldn't. So I think this is a very complex thing. Uh, this is, uh, I usually label this kind of, of, of uh, problem as the, the unwanted population, which, which, which just happens with intention or, 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 and I think this is a big problem in, 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 in Eastern Europe. It's, it's, it's the massive population of, 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 of the dogs who get abandoned and, and be put in shelters later. And these yes. dogs are, are, are and, 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 and uh, I think this, this is also another problem that these dogs are completely or more or less completely missed the proper socialization. They get sort of ruined in their, in their interactions with the human. And in many cases, these dogs are not easy to to rehabilitate uh, later on. And, and to rehome these kind of dogs, uh, kind of is, 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 is a bit rude, I think, but to rehome these dogs with this kind of uh, uh, behavioral issues and with such experiences is really, really hard, really difficult in many cases. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you also touch, you've touched on this several times, um, but maybe indirectly is also this kind of social media culture of you know getting a dog because it has this, characteristic and we see this very commonly in, in Asia as well um, you know uh, Asia often will emulate uh, you know what they see in in Western countries and societies and we're seeing more and more of dogs you know almost serving as like a handbag right a, a fashion accessory 
um, working at, you know, the largest shelter in Thailand, I can't tell you how many of, of the Nordic breeds that we had, you know, Huskies, and you just think, oh, what are you, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, it's so hot, uh, you yeah. know, with severe hemodicosis and, and skin issues. Uh, and again, they haven't been socialized. They're incredibly challenging to, to rehome. And so, you know, this is certainly uh, an in, becoming increasingly an issue in, in the places where I work. Sometimes I have the feeling that we, we always say that, that oh, dogs are family now and we love dogs, but sometimes I think people, uh, when, when we are talking about action, not words, but how people behave and act, uh, they, they really consider dogs and other animals uh, as objects, as accessories for their lives. And I think this is a huge problem. And sometimes I'm really, uh, this, this is this is a weak point of mind, uh, anthropomorphism, the way we started to, to treat dogs as, as, as humans. And I think this is a starting point of, 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 of many, many animal welfare issues. When I, I hear stories, for example, uh, in the news, and, and recently animal welfare organizations in Hungary started to, to speak up that people take dog bags to shelter because the dog was not that uh, joyful, thankful for them, for being rescued, and the dog has behavioral issues. It just shows to me that, that, that these people had no clear idea about what it takes to have a dog. And, 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 and it takes effort and time. And it's not just that, oh, sit on the couch next to me and be very cute because you are yeah. a dog. <laughs> so, yeah, and, I totally agree. And, 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 and uh, it, is, it, it was mentioned earlier that, that, that uh, changing human behavior is, 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 is kind of not, not easy, but it is not impossible if you know the way how to do that. How can you, can you convince the society, and not just the society, but a government, because, because you can't skip governments, because you need the lawmakers, you need the support of, of law enforcement. And, and after that, or, or parallel to that, you need the, the, the support and the cooperation of the society. And I think this is not an easy issue, but you have personal experience about that. Well, for Eastern Europe, I think um, the interesting thing is that most uh, um, governments and municipalities already dedicate resources to um, reduce the population of stray dogs and cats. Um, unfortunately, it's a complex topic um, and there is no one solution that uh, can be implemented um, that will fix the issue instantly. So where we see a real gap is this knowledge about um, how dog population management can be done humane and um, effective and efficiently in a sustainable way. And I think this is where really um, getting this information out and collaborating with municipalities comes in. Um, this is what we are trying to do, um, really to strategically advise mayors, strategically advise um, lawmakers that their appro approach needs to be multifaceted, that they need to have education as well as um, sterilization programs, as well as uh, good rehoming center, as well as, um, you know, some additional resources for dogs that potentially cannot be, be um, placed in a home um, at this stage, some form of guardianship, for example, in order to increase their welfare. So um, for Eastern Europe, yes, um, the resources are always too limited, um, but it's also a topic of directing the resources to where they can be spent in the most efficient way instead of just building another big shelter. Yeah, totally. I mean, I guess just to add to that, um, you know, it really shouldn't be a tough sell. I was going to say it isn't a tough sell, but I think it shouldn't be a tough sell because particularly in, in countries where rabies is an issue, uh, you know, public health is, is form on, you know, on people's minds, particularly political stakeholders. Nobody wants children, you know, being bitten by dogs, contracting yeah. rabies. Um, not to mention it's, you know, obviously a public health risk, but also a PR nightmare. And so we very much try to couple this, you know, couple the idea of rabies control, you know, with mass vaccination um, and really try to couple that with the need for dog population management as well. 
Um, everybody wants the same thing. I think at the end of the day, everyone sitting at the table wants the same thing. They want less dogs on the street. Even if you're a dog lover, you want less dogs on the street, right? Because you want them in homes and you want them to have the appropriate care. And so th the question is always, well, how do we do that most effectively? Like nobody's arguing that we want dogs on the street and we want animal welfare issues. Um, the question is always, yeah, how do we prioritize the use again of, of very limited resources in the most effective way? Um, and so that's where the discussion starts. <laughs> yeah. It is, it is so good that you mentioned the, the, the problems caused to the, to the human society by stray dogs, because sometimes it is so strange to see uh, that even people operating in animal welfare they, they completely forget about this aspect. Uh, because that there is, this, and it is very serious, it, it can lead to very serious problems. And uh, luckily in, in many parts of Europe, it is, it is not a huge problem, but, but, but for example, rabies, attacks, whatever, is a huge problem for, for the society. And we always forget about that because, okay, we love dogs, with our family and we want all dogs to have a home because a dog belongs to a home. We have this, this kind of image, but meanwhile, it, it, uh, it, is, it can be a really serious problem in any country. Yeah, absolutely. And it just takes one case, right? And that dog could be an imported dog, right? It could, you know, there's a lot of different scenarios, but all it takes is one dog, one child getting bitten, you know, uh, and, and a death you know, unfortunately for, for people to take this <laughs> a bit more serious, um, but it's certainly uh, an important lever. It, it provides us important leverage in Southeast Asia um, because, you know, never has been public, has public health, this one health concept been more on people's minds, you know, than it has now. And so it's an important point to discuss that, you know, human health and animal health are intrinsically linked. Uh, and so, you know, we can't have the health of one population without the other. Mm -hmm. And another aspect that we see in Eastern Europe is also um, for uh, if there's a lot of free roaming um, stray dogs, this is really unpleasant for the responsible pet owners. Um, have you ever tried walking your dog in a park with a lot of uh, free roaming dogs? It's not fun. Um, uh, and so um, this is another aspect that um, I think it's um, it's not very fair um, for uh, the the to from the side of the irresponsible people that just uh, let their dogs out and abandon them or do whatever they want, um, and then um, actually lay, lay that burden on the responsible um, owners that walk the dogs in a leash and try to exercise them in an appropriate way. Um, there is areas where um, this is not even possible, and so this is not very fair. And this is where management comes in again. You know, with a well-managed stray dog population, we can also direct them. We can make sure that they are not feeding and hanging out around kindergartens, for example, or elementary schools. Um, it's not fair that kids have to um, be scared of dogs when they walk on their way to school. Um, so if we can humanely reduce the population and um, build up some form of guardianship for them so that um, they spend time in areas where they will not bother um, children or elderly people that are just trying to do their daily shopping, um, then um, everybody gains from this, the dogs as well as the humans, because um, conflict doesn't, there's, there's no, no winner um, if there's conflict between dogs and humans. It's, uh, I think uh, it, it is obvious for, for anyone listening to us at the moment that it is a much, much more complex problem than just, okay, let's find homes for all dogs because, because it, is, it is not good for them. And the solution is probably even more complex because, because I, I, I try to, to sum up what, what I learned from you uh, based on your experience uh, that, first of all, it matters which continent, which country and which territory we talk about because we need an absolutely different approach. You have to uh, examine and assess why those dogs are on the streets. What is the reason behind? And it all connects to, to, to human behavior and human and how, how people think, how people act, 
how they react or they ha or how they neglect situations because it's also a behavior. And uh, you have to, to, to target uh, the, the, the root of their behavior to change how they decide, how they start to keep a dog. And, and after a while, if you, if you target these kind of things, after a while, with the cooperation of the society, the authorities, the government, you can achieve change, but you really need to understand the situation where you are operating. Am I, am I right about this? Did I manage to sum up, sum up the, the, the core of, of these things? Sounds so complicated, doesn't it? <laughs> Wish Actually, it was easier. <laughs> but it's not. That is not. And and yeah. the reason, and and just between us, the reason why I I wanted to 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 cover this topic in such depth, and that's why I'm I'm happy to to have your opinion, your experience, because because you are in the field, you 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 know what you you are talking about by experience that for me it is it is very sad to see when animal welfare organizations without the proper knowledge it was also mentioned uh, without proper knowledge without knowing what to do uh, precisely effectively they are just struggling they want to achieve something and after a while they realize that it's, there, there is no, no actual gain in their work and in their efforts uh, but it's just getting worse. And, and I think it is very important to say, see that, that the problem is not that it is complex. The problem comes when you, you don't realize how you, how, you, how you should do things to, to achieve something. When you and just treat the symptoms instead of yeah. also working on the underlying causes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I, I I do hope it was helpful for 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 many people out there because because it is it is a must, and and we will put there is a document I wanted to mention at the beginning but it is it is also good now, uh, there is a document with the, with the title Humane Dog Population Management Guidance and it was created by the International companion animal management coalition this document is available in english and if i'm right in spanish as well and this document i, I read it's, it's it's big it's long uh it's it's over 100 pages and it has a lot of further references and i think this is probably the most detailed uh document giving guidance and help and advice for, for governments, for lawmakers, for, for animal welfare organizations. It, it, it completely covers the, the whole topic. I, it, it is really long, but I loved reading this because it is so, so detailed and so, so helpful. And, and I will put the, the link to the, to the description for, any, for anyone who would like to, to go deeper into the topic. But you cannot really, really skip this step to understand what and uh, how you should do. So I do thank both of you for your time and, and sharing your, your, your experience and ideas and thoughts. Uh, this is a very important topic and there are many, many reasons why we should, should handle uh, the situation of, of stray dogs uh, effectively. It is important for the human society and it is important for the dogs, and we are responsible for the dogs. And and I, I, I honestly hope that that we could give some 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 professional insight on the topic. So I, I'm really thankful for you, and uh, for the audience. Please uh, follow our channels to get notification when we come out with a new episodes in the FCI podcast channel. So thank you, everyone, and see you and hear you soon. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.